Okay, uh, good evening members, friends and guests. Welcome to the Battle of Homestead Foundations program series. Uh, this special event is co-sponsored with the White Whale Bookstore on Liberty Avenue in Bloomfield. A special shout out to Bookstore Events Coordinator, Anna Claire Weber, she's with us tonight, and owners Jill and Adley Yeomans, and all the White Whale patrons here tonight. I'm John Hare, president of the BHF board. Tonight, we'll dig deeper into the fertile industrial and social history of our region. We'll cover a period in which our grandparents, parents, and ourselves have lived. And we'll talk about how this history now shapes our lives and future. Our guide is the activist and intellectual assistant professor of history at the University of Chicago, Gabriel Winant, author of the Next Shift, The Fall of Industry and the Rise of Healthcare in Rust Belt America. I couldn't put this book down. It's so comprehensive, a model people's history account, starting always with the exhausting and precarious lives of workers in their communities with salient focus on racial and ethnic minority workers. Winant also spotlights the ever dynamic economic and political developments that conditioned both post-war steelworkers and today's caregivers in monopoly, mostly nonprofit private healthcare systems. Have you ever wondered why the giant US steel building downtown is today labeled UPMC? And also how, despite the fact that more than 80% of the revenues accrued to UPMC originate as public tax dollars or union pension funds, the giant healthcare system gets away with firing union organizers and pays no federal, state, or local taxes on its huge surplus after expenses. You read the book and you're gonna find out why. Uh, in addition to Dr. Winant, we'll hear from selected uh, respondents, labor journalist, Alex Press. You can read Alex articles in Jacobin Magazine and on her Twitter account. And former organizer, local union president and SEIU national vice president, Rosemary Trump, my old boss. And we're also honored tonight to have several of the individuals whose stories or testimony appear in the book. I hope they will be moved to comment in the question and answer period to follow. Everyone, please write out your questions to the speakers and post them on the chat. Our, our podcast expert, Nathan Ruggles, will curate the questions and pass them on uh, for response by Gabriel and the other respondents. We won't be able to get to them all, but we'll do our best in the time allotted. Uh, let me briefly tell you about the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Uh, more than 175 years ago was the Battle of Homestead. Uh, at the centennial of the Battle of Homestead in 1982, 92, 1992, uh, the, our founders, were inspired by the dramatic labor conflict of the 1892 Battle of Homestead and began to talk about forming an organization to commemorate it. The nation's eyes then in 1892 were on the strong steel union, the amalgamated, that had built powerful alliances with the community and the region. While this epic struggle was ultimately defeated by the monopoly steel coal empire controlled by Andrew Carnegie and his henchman, Henry Clay Frick, we dig deeper in the Battle of Homestead to discover and celebrate the seeds of hope in that resilient workers and community struggle. Our mission is to grow those seeds by promoting a people's history, but also we work to empower today's workforce and build strategies for a future that benefits all working families in our nation. Our goal, a practical one, but a big one, is to develop a regional center and institute for labor history right here in the Mon Valley and the future of work. Institute for labor history and the future of work. The COVID pandemic forced us to change how we do this mission. 
Our public panels, historic commemorations, concerts, and drama are now and for the present presented online with publicity generated by social media. Perhaps this fall, we can go back to face-to-face -face meetings, we'll see. Actually, we've discovered new opportunities through social media to reach out, educate, fundraise, and organize. Today, the seeds of hope still sprout anew, even as our country faces major social, economic, and political crises. But crisis can also mean opportunity. Uh, since November 3rd, we can begin to see the light. We take heart and recognize the tremendous organizing by grassroots groups throughout the nation, often in coalitions with organized labor and other community organizations. This heroic effort was the engine that expanded the electorate, giving voice to millions of average working people. And this movement propelled the, electrical, the <laughs> electoral defeat of a mendacious anti-democracy president and his morally bankrupt enablers. And how can we not recognize such progressive grassroots organizing in the local re election results this week? A mayoral candidate vowing to, quote, hold UPMC accountable to the public, won. And also a slate of common pleas court judicial reform candidates, mostly women in black or other racial minorities, also won the Democratic primary. In Pittsburgh and usually Allegheny County, this is tantamount to election in November. That organizing is growing. Of course, the Battle of Homestead does not engage in political activities. We're nonprofit and charitable. However, I'm more optimistic about our mission as we see the growth of power for working people and their communities. So we value the dignity of work. We celebrate labor's rich heritage and its pivotal place in our society. We advocate community engagement through programs and partnerships, and we work to build human rights within a robust democracy. Come join us. More about our exciting upcoming programs in the wrap up later tonight. Now I'm delighted to give the mic to Gabriel Winant, a dynamic speaker as well as a dynamic writer, an academic who understands and values the progress of humankind when working men and women join together, speak for themselves, build alliances with allies, and if necessary, cause good trouble. So Gabriel, thank you so much for being with us tonight and um, take it away. Well, thank you for uh, having me. I'm really honored to be here and really tremendously appreciate the generous introduction, John. And let me just say, um, I've never been to Whitewell Bookstore. I, I look forward to going and I'm grateful to you all for co-hosting. Uh, but I can be a little more effusive about the Battle of Homestead Foundation, uh, which many members of, of which, uh, when I first started doing this research, you know, hosted me over breakfast in Homestead, uh, introduced me to people to interview and talk to about the history of the region and their own experiences. I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today about this event who used to work uh, as a union organizer for Unite Here, the Hotel Workers Union in Pittsburgh. And he said, you know, we were fighting this losing battle. It's so hard to get any workers involved at Rivers Casino. And anytime someone stepped up and wanted to get involved, I would take them to uh, to the, the, you know, the, the pump house gang breakfast. So they could kind of take some heart from this group and their meetings um, and know the history that they're a part of. And I found that really powerful and meaningful. So I wanted to share it as just as a reflection of what this group means. Uh, so I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about the book uh, and just lay out the kind of core narrative and argument of it to you all. And then I hope we can have a discussion about it including reflecting the experiences of various people here who lived through the events in the book, and I, which I did not. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen uh, for the, I have a kind of PDF slideshow. Is that working? Yep. Great. Okay. So I want to start in the present, and in particular with a category, a term that we've heard a lot of in the past year, which is the term essential worker. Uh, if you ask a healthcare worker now, you know, what do you think about this phrase? They'll roll their eyes at you generally, right? Because it's, it's, it's so ironic and painful now to have been treated uh, the way they were. And yet, you know, sort of given this empty honor of this term over the past year. Uh, but if we look at the idea of the essential worker, there is something significant in it. Essential workers are essential 
collectively. We depend on what they do. They hold our society together. And this was true before the pandemic. It's their individual experience of being disposable. That is what makes the term so painful and ironic. The collective function they carry out, we can't do without. Yet this doesn't necessarily raise their individual status or increase their economic power. And this is the paradox of the concept. It's a deeper one than an older one than COVID-19, though of course the pandemic has intensified it. So how did this come to be? This is a question that my book in a certain light is trying to answer. And I wanna to try to explain it first with the story of how we got the healthcare system we have today, particularly its role in employment and labor markets. Uh, this is a chart, a graph of healthcare and metal production in the Pittsburgh metropolitan labor market over the last 70 or so years. Uh, and the Pittsburgh experience is distinctive in a certain way, but it's also general in another way. It's general to the larger re uh, region that we sometimes call the Rust Belt or the you know, formerly industrial cities of the North and Midwest. We find healthcare employment especially concentrated in this region, this region that has a distinctive economic history. And this can help us understand why the healthcare industry is the way that it is now. The central argument of my book is that industrial job loss and the growth of the healthcare system are intimately connected to each other. And if you just look at these decades between 1970 and 1990, right, those are that rapid transition, that's not a coincidence. Uh, in, in fact, if you take populous counties in the United States and you rank them by how much of the workforce is in the census category called healthcare and social assistance. Here are your leading counties. Um, so you have you know, the Bronx up top, but very quickly you kind of look through these and you see we're looking at the formerly industrial North and Midwest. Allegheny County is number, what is it, five or six, uh, but the Bronx, Philadelphia, New Haven, Cleveland, Brooklyn, Pittsburgh, Boston, Newark, Rochester, Worcester, you get the idea. Healthcare is the largest sector of employment nationwide at 14% of all jobs in the country. But at the top of this list, you can see it's 25%. And in fact, there are neighborhoods in all of these cities, um, in Co-op City in the Bronx or North or West Philadelphia or the South and West sides of Chicago where I live, uh, and certainly in parts of Pittsburgh, there you'll find neighborhoods where 30 or 35 or even 40% of people's jobs are in healthcare and social assistance. And what you won't find ranking so high are a lot of places in the Sun Belt, you'll notice, in the South and West, even though these are places where old folks often go to retire. So you might expect that. You might expect that they have larger healthcare systems. And since I've written this book, I've found that this fact is still pretty surprising to a lot of people. A lot of people don't know that healthcare is the largest sector of the labor market nationwide. And they don't know particularly that the deindustrialized cities have this outsized healthcare sector in particular. Uh, Pittsburgh is still still steel city for a lot of people. And, you know, just a month ago, Joe Biden kind of used it to refer to the idea of bringing back manufacturing jobs. I'm sure you all remember Donald Trump used to do this all the time. And, uh, you know, there's a certain kind of media story that's been told over the last five or six years that I'm sure you all remember and like me generally sort of dislike. I'll give you a few examples. This is the kind of story where a reporter from a, you know, Washington or New York paper kind of journeys to the Rust Belt to get to the bottom of what's really going on. And they talk to some people in diners about why they support Donald, why coal miners or steel workers or auto workers support Donald Trump. And I, I read these stories. I try to pay attention to them in particular because I started noticing that the people who actually are in the stories are just as often not coal miners or steel workers or auto workers, but as in this story from Indianapolis, a healthcare worker, uh, the granddaughter of the union president at the famous carrier plant. This story from Williamson, West Virginia, which is a coal town, featured a uh, phlebotomist and a respiratory therapist. This story from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and steel town, not so far from Pittsburgh. Uh, Politico repeatedly interviewed a retired nurse as their kind of native informant. Uh, and here's a story from Manessa, which featured a worker at UPMC uh, in the New York Times. These are all from the, around the 2016 election. So there's something strange here. Healthcare workers are everywhere and they're nowhere. Like they sort of are pushing their way into these stories uninvited. Uh, and this is not a coincidence. You may remember about 10 years ago when UPMC tried to say that it doesn't have any employees uh, in a, the context of a both labor dispute and a tax dispute. Uh, so how did it come to be that this workforce is so large and at the same time doesn't exist? It's invisible. This is what my book tries to answer by studying Pittsburgh from about 1950 to about 2000. 
The healthcare economy developed to such a great extent in places like this because of how health insurance is connected to employment in this country, and particularly during the decisive post-war decades when the health, modern healthcare system was built, how health provision was institutionally linked to industrial employment and collective bargaining. This geographical pattern I just described a moment ago, the big healthcare industry in the Rust Belt is a trace of this linkage. Private health insurance became widely available to working class people in this country in the late 1940s and early 1950s after the failure of Truman, Harry Truman's effort to win a national health plan, what we would now call Medicare for all. Uh, private sector collective bargaining over welfare benefits such as health and retirement emerged as an alternative to that defeated strategy. And labor unions brought coverage to millions of their members and their family. Uh, in turn, union members formed a tremendous portion of the health insurance and healthcare market. By the end of the 1950s, uh, when, by which time Blue Cross had emerged as the nation's most important insurer, about 6% of its business came just from the steel industry. Uh, so in response to this growing market, hospitals grew, they upgraded, they stopped being places where the poor went to die, and they became houses of scientific care and dignity. The two-person room, for example, that we now know too well, uh, replaced the multi-bed ward, which had been traditionally where working class people went in their last days of life, uh, because the steelworkers contract gave them the right to a two-person two room. With this, costs rose. By the end of the 1960s, working class people who didn't have access to health insurance through having industrial jobs uh, increasingly were priced out. And they formed two groups. And these two groups were distinguished from each other in how deserving they were thought to be of health and economic security. The elderly and more marginally, the poor. So this was the economic and political origin of Medicare and Medicaid, which were established in 1965 to ensure these groups. But crucially, Medicare and Medicaid did not displace the system that had been built up over the previous 15 years in the private sector. They didn't, they didn't compete with the private insurance that groups like the steel workers now had. Instead, they rounded that system out, they plugged its gaps, and they left the main private sector system in place. So the shape of this system then comes to matter enormously as deindustrialization begins to affect the communities at the core of the system. So I'll give you this chart again. You can see how much uh, job loss happened in the decades even before the really rapid slide of the 1980s. We think of job, industrial job loss often as something from the 80s on, but it really began to affect places like Philadelphia, Detroit, Pittsburgh, New York even, uh, as soon as the Korean War was over in the mid-1950s. Pittsburgh lost almost 80,000 metal production jobs between 1950 and 1980. Half of, that workforce, half of the workforce had been eroded away before the really rapid slide. So what happens? when a community loses its economic base in this way? Well, working class people get poorer, obviously. The labor market baseline falls. I'm sure there are many people on this call who remember very vividly what this was like. And this process is racialized as well. It, presses, it pressed down on African-Americans first and hardest who were trapped in the worst jobs. They were the last hired and the first fired. But the population also gets older. This is both because the young leave, there's not as much opportunity for them to get especially young men to get jobs at the mill because of seniority uh, in a shrinking job market. Also because the big group that got hired in to work in the mills during World War II in Korea never got fully replaced and then began to reach retirement in the 70s and 80s. So deindustrializing places began to manifest disproportionately large elderly populations. As soon as the 60s and really getting more intense in subsequent decades, by 1990, Allegheny County was the second oldest uh, pop, you know, urbanized populous county in the United States after Broward County in Florida. So finally, the population gets sicker. This is both because it's getting older and older people are generally sicker and because it's getting poorer and poorer people are getting generally sicker, have more health problems. And finally, uh, because health insurance is actually still pretty good for a pretty big group of people Either they're over 65 or you know, over 55 or even 45 potentially and are early retirees from steel, or they work in a good job or in a household with someone in a good job. Uh, but for whatever reason, whatever of these reasons you still have insurance, some amount of the social distress that's beginning to happen, it manifests in the form of patient demand. And let me explain what this would look like. 
Rising economic distress destabilizes larger kinship systems built on extended family cooperation. So even if some of the older men are still at work at the mill, the fact that the younger ones can't join them starts to eat into the economic security of the extended family. That causes women, particularly younger women, to seek employment where their mothers otherwise might not, where their mothers might not have done so. So women's labor force participation rises really rapidly in the 1970s uh, under this pressure. For many women, this is you know really emancipatory, uh, right, to have a, their own source of income and security. But there's also economic pressure driving it. Um, as this happens. The supply of free care formerly available from women in the household, that's to say it was expected that they would you know, work for free as wives and daughters, is diminished. And this had provided the overwhelming portion of elder care and even low level attendance to health needs. But if you have good health insurance, that's okay because you can use the hospital basically like a medium term nursing home. And this is basically what winds up happening to a large degree. Um, you can see in this slide just the various, various measures on which uh, in the early 80s, the Pittsburgh region is outstripping the norm on various kinds of what they call healthcare utilization. Um, but let me give you another figure. In 1979, Pittsburgh generated an astronomical 1.6 inpatient hospital days per capita. So what that means is if everyone in the region used the hospital the exact same amount as each other, everyone in 1979 would have spent 1.6 days in the hospital day and a half basically in the hospital that year. Now, of course, everyone doesn't use the hospital the same amount. Most people never go, but a lot of people go for quite a long time, right? And that gives you that enormous figure, which is triple our national level today. Nor is this unique to Pittsburgh. Uh, here is the list of the 23 cities that rank ahead of Pittsburgh in the early 1980s in average length of hospital stay. Uh, and I'll just read it to you slow so you can notice the pattern. New York, Omaha, Jersey City, Cleveland, Buffalo, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, Yonkers, Detroit, Chicago, Indianapolis, Syracuse, Kansas City, Fort Wayne, Akron, Providence, Dayton, St. Louis, Worcester, Rochester, Washington, and Milwaukee. Of all of these, only Washington, D.C. is not a big factory town. Um, so the healthcare system got enormous to service all this demand. In 1980, Pittsburgh had five hospital beds per 1,000 people. By 1990, it had seven per thousand people, compared to a national level today of just under three. So that's regionally more than twice as much hospital capacity per person as we have nationwide today. Then finally, when deindustrialization really takes a hard downward turn in the early 80s, uh, and this is the moment that I'm sure many people remember most painfully, it speeds all of this up. Outmigration of the young accelerates, existing forms of social services are cut really, really sharply, the population itself experiences intense physical distress. Uh, you know, I mean, anecdotally, there's a million stories from this time, right? Everyone I know had a heart attack, right? People getting cancer and all kinds of things, alcoholism, substance abuse proliferating under the intensity of what was a kind of localized Great Depression. Uh, there's a 2009 study by a couple of economists who went back and looked at unemployment claims, you know, claims on unemployment insurance between 19, basically in the early 80s. Uh, filed by high seniority industrial workers. So this is steel workers who've worked at the mill for 25 years or 20 years, file, file, you know, lose their job in 1983, uh, file for unemployment. That generates a record. And these economists say, okay, so we can go look at these guys and see what happened to them. And they find that for people who meet that description, risk of death increased 50 to 100% in the immediate years after job loss. So, uh, there's an astounding toll on the population from this kind of rapid slide, but the healthcare system is actually in various ways kind of safeguarded from this. That's not to say many individuals don't lose their insurance and suffer in all kinds of ways, they do. But compared to virtually every other part of the welfare state, the social safety net, healthcare is in surprisingly good shape. Medicare and Medicaid budgets increase through this time. Um, you can see in the bottom left here, the Medicaid budget through these years growing as more people qualify for it because they're getting poorer. Um, collectively bargained benefits lasted for some months or even years after layoff and retiree benefits typically remained secure for decades more. It was only in the nineties and two thousands that people really started to get those stripped away from them. Uh, and often they could kick in, as I said, as early as age 45. So you have this one source of economic security, relative economic security is one stream of income that keeps flowing, keeps pumping as everything else is getting cut off. 
and a population that therefore increasingly are going to become patients so that they can attach themselves to this source to stay alive. And with this, the healthcare economy is gonna keep growing and keep adding jobs in, in really stark contrast to everything around it. As men are being pushed out of secure industrial work, particularly women flood into these jobs, especially women of color, African-American women, a very high rate, women at very high rates. Uh, but these are much lower paying and more insecure jobs than the ones that they were replacing in the labor market. Finally, uh, and this is the kind of last chapter of the book, in the mid 80s, Congress panicked about the effect of all this growth on healthcare costs and imposed a reform on Medicare that cut off some of this growth in hospital income. But by this time, they couldn't cut off, this, they couldn't turn off the healthcare faucet altogether. Now too many people were dependent on it for their basic social needs. They could just rearrange it. So they squeezed hospital costs and a lot of that care flowed out of hospitals into nursing homes and home care. Uh, which have continued to grow steadily, grow steadily ever since. So what I've been saying to you uh, to kind of conclude this talk is that the healthcare system grew up as a channel of political and social conflict. It met social needs and was organized through political action to meet social needs. But it was always an external adjunct to industrial production. Healthcare workers were not covered by labor law until the 1970s, which is part, a major part of the reason that most of UPMC, all, virtually all of UPMC remained non-union today. This is an image from a uh, defeated strike in 1970 at Presby. Um, they weren't covered by wage and hour regulations until the late 60s. And because the industry's institutional origin was to serve the more organized and secure fractions of the working class, it drew on the relatively powerless sections for its own labor needs. And labor costs matter tremendously in this story. Um, you know, we can think of it in a certain way. John said at the beginning of this talk that 80% of, of UPMC's income comes from either the public sector or from collectively bargained benefits. Uh, we, so we can think of healthcare providers like, like hospitals, like doctors, as a kind of subcontractor for the public. And we all know, right, if your boss subcontracts a job, why are they doing it? Because they're trying to hold costs down. That's what subcontractors are for. That's what the whole privatized healthcare system is for, is to hold down labor costs. Because healthcare was and remains very labor intensive work, particularly in its outpatient and non-hospital based forms, but even in hospitals. Uh, for example, labor accounts for two thirds and sometimes more of the operating costs of a nursing home. And the care economy is really distinctive because it offers so little opportunity for what we call productivity increase of the kind that sustained the employment relationships in earlier industrial contexts. You know, you could always make a car, you know, slightly more efficiently per man hour than you could the year before, make it make a ton of steel slightly more efficiently each year than you could the year before. Uh, that's much harder to do in a nursing home to get more care per hour out of a nursing assistant. Or you can try, but you're going to degrade the quality of the product. That's to say the care. Um, and that's what's happened, obviously, to a large degree this year. Uh, but without for a moment letting employers off the hook, we should understand that this dynamic is structural. It's built into how we've constructed our care industries by privatizing them, by consigning those who work in them to the margins of the economy for decades, thereby conscripting poor women to fill this role. Care jobs accounted for 56% of new low wage jobs in the US in the 1980s. 63% in the 1990s and 72% of new low wage jobs in the 2000s. That's an astonishing proportion of new low wage jobs coming from these industries because care has been our system for absorbing and managing the damage of deindustrialization. And from the perspective of healthcare workers, this dynamic manifests as downward pressure on their wages on and on staffing. More than almost anything else, what healthcare workers of any stripe will tell you if you ask what's wrong with your job, is that there are not enough of them, they have too much to do and not enough time to do it. And this takes me back to the paradox of which I began of essential work. The industry that has grown in terms, the industry has grown in, in terms of employment extraordinarily rapidly. It's eating the labor market. It looks set to continue to do so. Uh, but it still creates an experience for individual workers and workplaces where, where workers report again and again and again, there needs to be more of them. And as I said, understaffing was central to the nursing home disaster of the past year. So this is what I mean when I say the paradox of essential work, that they're collectively indispensable, but individually disposable, is much older than 2020. And this paradox, I think, frames the struggles that have developed and certainly will further develop around the healthcare industry. So I'll end just by saying, 
I also think it's a dynamic paradox. The healthcare system holds our society together. That's what I've been arguing these last 15, 20 minutes. Um, it stepped in when things fell apart for good and ill. It absorbed all that damage and made it possible to keep going. But the cost of that has been dehumanization of patients, the exploitation of workers, even as those patients rely on those workers for their own well-being and survival. Uh, so it's simultaneously an engine of inequality, and it's also out of our social, out of our democratic control because it's privatized. But that generates conflict, it generates organization, it generates activity, and we should expect it to continue doing so, I think, more and more. I'll stop there. Thank you for listening to me for so long. Uh, and I'm looking forward to questions and discussion. So, let, so let's go to Alex. And uh, Alex, uh, you're the first commentator on this. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I just want to, first of all, say thanks to the people who put this event on. This is very exciting. Um, Gabe is both a, a friend of mine and one of my favorite writers and thinkers. Um, and as he knows, and as I mentioned to some of the organizers, my dad uh, is a UPMC healthcare worker himself. Um, and actually reading this book, I recognize several of the last names. I actually grew up with the children of some of the people uh, mentioned in this book, and including some people who are on this call. Actually, I know your kids. Uh, and so uh, unlike many of the academic histories I read, this one really felt very close to home. Um, so I just want to sort of highlight a few things. I don't want to talk forever um, because there are already good questions in the chat. Um, I just want to say, you know, some of the things that I found most useful in this book as someone who sort of thinks about working class power, talks to workers all the time. I'm a labor reporter, um, also, you know, a left wing person who wants to rebuild, you know, working class power in this country. Um, it was really good at demystifying a couple things. So first of all, you know, I think Gabe opens the first chapter uh, with this anecdote about a steel worker who sort of reluctantly takes a job at the mill. And he's so reluctant about it that he refuses to buy a lunch pail. He doesn't want to invest, right? Because that would be a defeat, showing that he really is in this job for the long haul. So he keeps using a bag for lunch, even though rats are eating it. Um, and I think, you know, it's a little anecdote. It's very memorable, of course, because we all know the feeling of not wanting to admit you really are taking a job that you've taken um, and until you can't, you know, you've been there long enough and finally you have to admit it. Um, but also I think demystifies our sense of what these jobs are like and how they were different to crappy jobs today, right? So these jobs sucked in steel mills um, in, in different ways than healthcare <laughs> jobs suck. Um, but there was nothing inherent in the industry, right, that made a job good or bad. You know, I think that's really important. Gabe lays out the constraints of different industries. Um, there were different constraints for steel workers and how much they could get in bargaining power than there are for healthcare workers. And that's a key part of Gabe's analysis. But at the same time, jobs are, you know, sort of what workers can make of them. Um, and I think that's an important sort of point in the book. Um, Gabe also mentioned in the beginning of his talk, um, you know, that, there's some the sort of, um, I guess, uh, sort of this dreaminess put on Pittsburgh about the steel town. I actually was at an event with a bunch of people in Pittsburgh last night, and they talked about this. This is the labor city, or at least it used to be, um, is what one of my friends said to me. And they meant industrial jobs um, used to be here. And, you know, we had a discussion about this is still a city that's full of working class people. So what is what does this understanding of labor mean? Um, and Gabe, instead of just refuting it in the book and sort of saying, you know, not all workers are just steel workers, not all workers are white men, they're actually women, people of color, he actually shows that the one creates the other, right? These are intimately tied groups of workers, um, which I think is a much more powerful response um, when we get this sort of, uh, like, I guess the New York Times style look at, like, does the working class just mean white workers who worked in steel mills? I think instead of just saying, no, we mean low wage women of color and service jobs. I think if we can relate how the one connects to the other, basically that big X in the, the graph that Gabe does, I think that creates a much more powerful understanding um, that these aren't groups that are just uh, sort of both workers, but they actually need each other and they rely on each other. Um, other things that I just wanna highlight for the discussion is, um, you know, this book is really good with explaining class formation. Um, so Gabe writes, that the factories didn't just make metal goods, they made people, institutions, a way of life and a social world. Um, healthcare likewise is um, a site of class formation. Um, workers relate to one another 
as different segments of the hospital employee, employee um, group. They relate to patients. They, they meet them as antagonists in our current model often. Um, there are many examples in the book of, of workers in healthcare jobs sort of, you know, looking out for patients and going above and beyond and their bosses exploiting them on the basis of that willingness. But at the same time, the way that the system has been designed does put them at odds with, with the needs of their patients. Um, and so I think that highlighting these sort of antagonisms that have been built into this model that Gabe lays out so well um, is very useful in overcoming them, right? I mean, and that's the other thing I just wanted to highlight is that while well, Gabe tells, I think a, I would call it a tragedy, a story, for example, of how union steel workers were at first fighting for universal health care and then gave up and cut a deal, right? They just felt they couldn't win. There's a variety of reasons that happened in that story. It is not that simple. Um, but at the end of the day, the tragedy is that they, they take health care connected to their job. And in doing so, they create another exclusion, right? Where they're inside um, this sort of privileged group that has access to care. Um, and others are fall outside of it, right? And so that's a tragedy, um, but it also creates a sense of this being a contingent reality and that we can choose a different path, right? If healthcare jobs are what is growing at such a massive rate, it's such a huge part of our economy now. Um, if care is this overwhelming structuring force of how we relate to one another, there is something promising and hopeful in that, right? Um, it means that we do have a basis now for a different kind of relation to one another and a different form of healthcare um, that I think is really useful when we think about organizing efforts that are, you know, have long been ongoing. Gabe details some of them even at UPMC. Like I was shocked to read uh, about a Presby strike where the, the chant was union power, soul power. Uh, this just seems so wildly out of my understanding of what um, working at Presby is like and what struggles are happening there. Um, so while those struggles have been going on, you know, I think they've they've intensified or at least gotten you know very hairy in the past year because of the pandemic. You know, nurses have gone on strike even in the midst of a pandemic because they have felt that if they want to look out for their patients, they have to look out for themselves and vice versa. That staffing levels have become dangerous um, and conditions have become completely untenable. Um, and so I just think there's a lot of potential in this book, um, and I think it's a very useful way of situating ourselves in the present. Um, and giving us a tool to sort of demystify certain things that that I, at least, I know growing up experience as very different parts of the world, steel work versus healthcare, um, you know, labor organizing versus caring for the infirm and the elderly. Um, and so I just, you know, I'll end by just reiterating what everyone else will say, I'm sure, which is that it's a very useful book um, for people not just interested in history, but in changing the present in the future. Well, good. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, I'm Rosemary Trump. I'm a, a former union organizer with the Service Employees Union in, uh, in healthcare. And uh, I too want to thank uh, Gabe, uh, Gabe Wynan for really writing this very, very important work um, about the shift of uh, Pittsburgh's economy from a post-World post War II unionized high-wage industrial economy to unfortunately uh, what was to become a low wage, non-unionized healthcare economy. And, um, you know, as we've seen and uh, uh, gave uh, reviews, our history, uh, the impact on today's workers and our communities and uh, fortunately recommends uh, solutions for the future. And uh, gave documents that the economy and work like of, of the 1890s are very alive and well uh, here in the uh, year of 2021. You know that the uh, that over 100 years later, uh, uh, you know we're alleged to be the uh, most livable city, uh, one of the most livable cities in the world, our city of Pittsburgh. But at the same time, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the conditions of work uh, in the 1890s, who was uh, the chief executive uh, officers, but uh, one Andrew Carnegie and H.C. Frick, and who were they? They were anti-union, anti-democratic, multimillionaire executives that employed the largest number of exploited workers at the end of the 19th century. Uh, in that industrial economy. And what do we have today but Jeffrey Romoff and, uh, 
and his cohorts, uh, other UPMC uh, healthcare uh, executives that are anti-union, anti-democratic, uh, multi-millionaire executives that employ the largest number of our exploited workers today. Um, and the parallels truly are, are striking. Uh, industrial workers before the union made uh, poverty wages. They worked 12 hour days. They worked without benefits like health insurance, pensions and paid leave. And they uh, worked in dangerous and unsafe conditions. And, and of course, without a voice on the job, they didn't have unions. So too do uh, tens of thousands of healthcare workers today. And while CEO Romanoff uh, receives compensation of uh, recently reported $9.49 million this last year, along with 31 uh, of his cohorts who received uh, more than $1 million, the workers, of course, uh, are still living in uh, substandard wages with some standard benefits. Today, uh, U UPMC is the largest employer in Pennsylvania with over 92,000 employees, and they control over $23 billion of our economy. For the most part, these $23 billion are, as Gabe talked about, taxpayer paid dollars. Uh, and as John talked about, it's, uh, uh, that's over 80% of their revenue that goes to UPMC uh, from our financed uh, Medicare, taxpayer financed Medicare and Medicaid dollars. And if you actually count the taxpayer dollars that is paid through the third parties like Blue Cross and Blue Shield and other uh, commercial insurances for school district, federal, state, local government workers, uh, subcontracted uh, workers uh, of the federal government, the percentage is actually much higher than 80%. And how did, uh, you know, so we have to ask the question, well, how did Medicare and Medicaid get passed by our legislatures? Well, guess what? The workers did it. The workers did it through uh, their co collective efforts uh, of their unions and lobbied on behalf of getting uh, Medicare passed. And in fact, the AFL-CIO had a major uh, uh, person assigned to that committee by the name of Nelson Cruzshank that actually did write the legislation that was passed uh, back in the early 1960s. And then, of course, how did Blue Cross and Blue Shield and other commercial insurance companies get so big? Well, again, <laughs> the workers did it, and they did it through their collectively bargained union contracts. And even today, unions continue to grow and protect the insurance industry by fighting for their members' paid insurance premium in every contract negotiations by ultimately having to concede wage increases to maintain their health benefits. In other words, take money that would normally go into their pocketbooks for their you know, uh, additional cost of food and cost of living and give it back to the health insurance industry for their premium increases. And then, you know, when that happens, we wonder why uh, there is wage stagnation for the lowest 80 percentile of the workforce over the last 40 years. It's because there's a big vacuum that takes those wage increases and gives it to the insurance industry. So the conclusion, you know, as Gabe points out, healthcare is a worker union taxpayer driven industry. And, uh, you know, it's up to us to hold our politicians, our elected community representatives, I like to call them, uh, and who should be our advocates, these politicians, if they are truly interested in addressing wage inequality issues, racial disparities and discrimination, uh, find a a way in which to provide affordable housing for clean air and water, for improved education and transportation, and improved health care delivery uh, in our communities so that we can all benefit by these improved conditions. It is time for health care workers and really all workers to be represented by a union and to have a single payer health care system. 
And this is the demand that I think Gabe's book sets up for us to be able to make. It is time to bring democracy to the healthcare workplace, to our communities, and to the essential worker who, who makes our economic system work every day. And we saw that during this pandemic. Uh, we saw how these uh, workers uh, went to work at their at their at the at life's risk uh, in order to uh, provide for care for us and and to keep our communities functioning and to keep our workforce out there so this is the pathway to making the city of pittsburgh truly the most livable city in the world we need to uh, legislate uh, we need to legislate medicare for all and we need to have uh, recognition for, by healthcare industries and providers, uh, and to have their uh, have unions for all of these healthcare workers. This is how we are going to make a society that works for everyone. Uh, it works very well uh, for the pharmaceutical industry. It works very well for the medical equipment industry. It works very well for Jeffrey Romark. Uh, Romoff and his associates at the top, but it is not working for the bottom. And the only way that we are going to hold them accountable is to provide for a way in which we can have health care for everyone through a public system, just as we have, as uh, Gabe points out in his book, that uh, you know, the educational system is run publicly, nationally. We can have a universal system of health care on a publicly administered basis where everyone wins, all segments of society wins. And, uh, and now I would like to ask uh, uh, another person who's on this uh, program, uh, this call, uh, uh, our vice president of the Battle of Homestead uh, Foundation, Steffi Domeik, who's also the labor educator uh, in the United Steelworkers Union and is familiar with all these deindustrialization issues and the transfer of our wealth uh, from uh, into the uh, healthcare industry. So, Steffi, I, I'd like for you to uh, make your, your remarks and perhaps you have a question for Gabe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Gabe. This is an incredible book. I just wanted to say that I, I worked at Clareton U.S. Steel from 76 to 81 and um, when I started there, there were a number of the women that I started with uh, who who came out of the healthcare industry, who were nurses or some, or you know, are um, who, who uh, not RNs, but generally uh, worked in healthcare and came to the mill because they could make better money, right? Because that was where the money was, um, uh, and also that that qu- the. Uh, there was so many, so much in the book that was sort of about my life and the life of the community that I got to know here in Pittsburgh. Um, I just want to mention a few of them. Uh, one, uh, because it's such an important detailed history. For those of you who haven't read, been able to read the book yet, I highly recommend it. Um, one thing was tracing the benefit increases that were allowed during World War II because wages were being held down, and that that it was sort of one of the the the, the ways that um, healthcare became a benefit. Benefit uh, healthcare and pensions uh, got uh, so it sort of shifted the negotiating strategies for the union from wages, uh, strictly wages, into benefits. Um, I thought that was really important and interesting uh, detail. Uh, and it, and the whole book really, really delineates uh, how employment in the steel industry enforced the racist barriers uh, of our culture in, within the, within the, um, within the industry, within, within the mills. And, and um, we can all, all of us who worked in the mills have stories about how that worked, um, but also about sort of uh, how the history of the steel industry, basically until the consent decree of 74, really um, uh, enforced gendered jobs uh, throughout our culture uh, regionally. Um, it's a very helpful history of how Blue Cross and Blue Shields started and um and and how the antagonisms between UPMC and Blue uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, became a reality. Um, as far as being uh, in in uh, in the steel industry or, or working in in the union, uh, my union now represents people in in all kinds of uh, industries, including healthcare. 
Um, many of our healthcare workers actually work in, in like at Monongahela uh, Hospital, uh, that's steel worker represented. Uh, and they basically people joined the union that they knew because we had steel workers in the region. Um, and one of the major issues in uh, in our in our negotiations nationally is the cost of health care for our um, our members. And we find that those uh, of our members who are in Canada don't have that problem because they have national health care and they're able to talk about other issues. Um, local issues, issues of importance on, on the job that we can't get to because we're stuck in trying to, 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 to uh, continue to, to pay for health care that really should be a, a national right. We, you know, we, we do need that national health care system that Rosemary talked about. So the one question I do have um, is about uh, how, uh, how this pandemic has changed the way we see health care and we're beginning to see it really as an infrastructure, you know, that we have an infrastructure that we need to support. And, you know, we have a series of infrastructure bills coming up um, that that perhaps we want to talk about healthcare as, uh, you know, something that is so important in the economy that it, be, it it's basic. And um, how do we pay for that? So uh, in the book, I got to a point where you talked about the trilemma, the trilemma of... Um, Low employment, rising wages, and fiscal res restraint, pick two, right? You get two, two of those. Um, but if fiscal restraint is taken out of that, that is the way that we just make money, you know, we print money, um, we don't need to have fiscal restraint. And that's something that um, I know one of my colleagues is on the call, uh, my friend Carolyn Kazin, and I have been talking a lot about the new monetary theory. And um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. It's kind of complicated, but this book really gave me some thoughts on, on, on really how healthcare can become that energizer. So that's my, my question. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll partly respond to that. And I imagine Alex also has some, who's been reporting on working conditions throughout the pandemic may have things to say also to that. Uh, thanks to Alex and to Rosemary and to Steffi. Uh, it's really, I mean, in various ways, I feel connected to all of you and I'm really glad to be here with you uh, and appreciate the generous comments and questions. Um, so let me just, uh, I guess the quick answer I'll try to give is that uh, I think that, to your question, Steffi, is that uh, I think you're absolutely right that we can make a different choice in that, in that uh, the unfortunate term, the trilemma between, yeah, pick two of these three things. Um, in fact, part of the argument of the book is that we chose the path of, that we're on now, of low wages, but rapid job creation with low wages in the service economy. We chose that path when we set up our privatized healthcare system. We didn't realize that's what we were choosing. We didn't know that's what it meant decades ago when we made that, created that institutional arrangement, but it set us down that path. Um, and there's no way, I think, off of the low wage path without creating public sector employment. Uh, there's no real reason we can't do that. You know, having our healthcare sector be administered by private, very often profit seeking actors is not more efficient. It's not more effective. It doesn't deliver better medicine. None of that. Right? There's no evidence for any of that. It's just a trap we fell into for political reasons and now we can't get out or thus far we've not been able to get out. Um, so we can talk more about, that. I see a lot of the questions are about this, um, but uh, I think that your, your, in, your response to this is absolutely right, Steffi, that uh, the public, like the public created this industry, the public should control it, it should be democratic. And if you think about, for example, in British politics, I don't know if you ever pay attention to this, anyone on this call, every time the British have an election, uh, if you tune into it, you know, Labour is saying, let's increase the NHS budget by 4.5% and hire 30,000 more doctors and 70,000 more nurses. And right. the Tories are saying, no, no, only 2%. And that's how their debate proceeds, right? Uh, about how their healthcare system should work. We sort of do this about public education to some extent in this country, but we can't imagine having a conversation like that about our healthcare system because we administer it through the market rather than through democracy. So uh, the argument of the book is that although we fell into this trap, we have a, accidentally a kind of way back out because 
having such an enormous engine of low wage job creation also created a constituency, right? It created a workforce of in a, any given city, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands in a big city and across the country, millions of people who, you know, they're not that organized everywhere or in most places yet, but uh, have the potential of standing together, have interests that can align with the patients and communities that depend on them. That's political work to create that alignment. It doesn't happen automatically, but it's possible. Um, and I think that, you know, there are near-term victories that can be won around wages and benefits and uh, union recognition and this kind of thing. But the, there are limits on those as long as the industry remains privatized. And I think that will drive the discussion, it, it will drive the kind of political conversation about it toward the question of driving out the profit motive from the industry. And I'll stop this answer just by saying, I think, the pan I mean, I'm guessing here, I'm speculating, I don't know. But I think the pandemic, if it's done anything, I think it has either revealed or maybe created also to some extent, just an enormous reservoir of rage uh, among so many people in so many different ways, but especially, you know, so-called frontline workers in the healthcare industry you know, many of them didn't like their boss already for whatever reason. Um, but to have the experience of, you know, seeing your boss calculating how likely it is that you're going to die and balancing that against, you know, various financial constraints that they're trying to deal with. I think whatever veneer of legitimacy and authority a lot of healthcare administrators had has really been stripped away. And I don't know if this is true, but I hope that if that's right, that we will see in the coming months and years a real upsurge of militancy and activity in that industry. There are a number of questions in the chat. Uh, I also note that we have some participants that were written about or alluded to in the book. Uh, uh, our good friends, uh, Joe Nagy and Emily Eckel that um, helped to uh, point out the deficiencies, the terrible deficiencies of the original John J. Cain um, uh, Hospital, which was the county operated uh, system for uh, care for the indigent, long-term care for the indigent. And I'm curious if uh, Joe or Emily would uh, want to make some comments on uh, the proceedings and if so, They'd be welcome to do so. Uh, we would need to unmute them if they did. <laughs> yeah, we'd need to highlight them, uh, spotlight them, Tess. We have them. to find them. Okay. <laughs> Emily. Yeah, that's my problem here. There's just so many people that showed up tonight. I can't find who we're looking for. Well, Emily, I can, uh, but I don't see her face. Emily, do you have a camera? I don't know. Can you unmute, Emily? Ask to unmute. Nope, she disappeared for me. How about Joe Nagy? Can we find Joe? Hi, I, I tried to unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Gabriel for his book. Um, I, I guess I, I, I have a question about what kind of uh, organizations uh, or organizational style uh, is going to be necessary for this kind of uh, confrontation that um, attacks both the quality of care at the same time as improving uh, wages, benefits, and, uh, and the conditions of uh, work for employees in the healthcare system. Uh, that kind of attack on both levels is not something that unions have typically done in the past. And I think it involves both uh, um, unions, patients, and the communities that benefit from uh, health care. Uh, how can we do that kind of organization? I think that's a difficult problem that 
we need to confront if we're going to make uh, serious progress uh, in improving health care and also the conditions of employment for health care workers. Yeah, well, that's a fantastic question. I mean, it's the one that keeps me up at night, Joe. Um, and I think it's a really, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard one, but it's an absolutely necessary one to figure out. And you're right that for various reasons, the labor movement is mainly, and understandably in many ways, has mainly been focused on, you know, the kind of bread and butter of its own members, um, as opposed to the larger structural question of the shape of the industry. Um, we can criticize that, we could defend it. There's various things you could say about that, but I think it's fair to say that that's, that's the reality generally. Um, you know, I think that um, there's a few challenges, particularly to the healthcare industry around this. The first is, as I've been emphasizing, it's privatization, right? And so it's not obvious that to, you know, a, a given patient or community member or even a worker that their working conditions or the conditions under which they receive care are intrinsically political in the way that they really are, right? That's sort of masked by the fact that they work for a private corporation. Second, the industry is very occupationally stratified. Um, you know, we don't have an industrial union of healthcare workers. I mean, SEIU is sort of this, right? But a lot of nurses are not in SEIU or in another organization. Um, and or it's not at all uncommon for a hospital to have three or four or five unions, if, if, if it's a union hospital, multiple recognized unions in the building. Um, so, you know, who speaks for healthcare workers, right? In what voice can the community, the patients and their family and, you know, people who depend on them, right? Who, who can they recognize as the legitimate voice of healthcare workers? That's a hard question. Um, and then there's a kind of whole, the way the whole community is tied up in it. I mean, I think it's great that Ed Ganey won and, you know, talking about taxing UPMC and this kind of thing. Um, but I think that the, there is a need for a new kind of organizational home that can unite these concerns and can begin to build practices of solidarity across these lines. Um, whether that's in fights like the fight to keep Braddock open, which was defeated obviously, but I think is, the, is an example of the kind of thing around which labor and patients and community members can come together and did come together or fight the fight around taxation and the tax exemption or fights around things like medical debt. I mean, there's a tremendous quantity of medical debt owed to UPMC, to any big hospital anywhere, any, any big city in the country. Um, these are political issues that around which I think unity can be built. And my hope is that the kind of rising activist left, I mean, I'm a member of DSA, I know Alex is a member of DSA, uh, and there, I'm sure there are others on this call, can, can in some way be a ho home for some of that and that the labor movement as it intersects with, with that will be a home for some of that. Um, but I do think it's necessary to find a way to bring together healthcare workers of different kinds into one organizational home. Um, whether that's you know, trying to build in the, an industrial union or whether it's creating a non-union type organization in which healthcare workers fight for a more just healthcare system. I do think that until healthcare workers are more like teachers who have been much more successful at this, uh, and you know, teachers speak for the schools in a way that we don't quite have in healthcare. Until we can do that, I think it's gonna be harder to win these fights. Although I, I do think that it's developing organically some already as the mayoral election indicates. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and uh, you know, I don't know if you were being, I mean, I don't know if you were thinking of your own experience, Joe. I was thinking of your experience in the 1970s when you were talking. Um, and for folks who don't know, Joe and Emily who are on this call and Mary Lou and who's not, uh, were involved in, as uh, I think John said, exposing um, uh, the abuse at the old John J. Kane nursing home uh, when it was one giant facility that the county owned. Um, and you know, then the committee to improve Kane did build a really powerful organization, uh, which remains really impressive to me having studied it and thought about it you know, in the present. Uh, an alliance of different kinds of activists and workers and organizations and elder, elder rights folks and so on uh, that really did defeat the effort to privatize that institution. And I think that is a tremendous example of the kinds of things that we need to replicate and expand on. And I would like to ask you um, about how you think 
people of color can be more involved in this effort. As I look at this call, most of the people I see are white. And when I remember working at Kane Hospital, that was not the case. Um, and, you know, how do we uh, engage people of color in leadership roles in, in this process? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm curious what others have to say about this as well. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I'll just say, I think African-American workers have led and continue to lead the struggle inside the hospital and nursing home system. Uh, I mean, that strike that I showed an image of in 1970 lost because in fact, it was almost all African-American workers participating and very few white workers wanted to get involved. Um, and I think that remains an ongoing challenge in, as I understand it, in SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania's organizing. Uh, there may be people on this call who know and can speak to this better than me, but that's my general understanding. Um, so I do think there is significant black leadership in workplace organizing around this, and it, it would seem in electoral activism around this too, uh, right? As again, the recent, um, the recent election suggests. Um, you know, I think that the activist left ha has always suffered from and continues to suffer from racial division of different kinds. And that this is it's really urgent for uh, activist left-wing organizations that are predominantly white to try to uh, involve their members in ongoing forms of struggle across racial lines that will build trust and solidarity. Um, and, you know, things like the Braddock fight that I mentioned, or the you idea know, of fighting over medical debt and struggles like this that are happening in many places, um, I think are real opportunities to do that and really deserve prioritization because I think it's a significant limit, as this call suggests, as you say, Emily, uh, it's a significant limit on our ability to generate solidarity until we, until we, we do that. I would um, just like to say thank you, everyone, for all the wonderful questions you've been submitting in the chat. Uh, I, I know I've, some of them have been covered already. Um, I, I would like to, um, and this, this, uh, this question goes, goes to Gay, but I, I think that our other speakers could certainly jump in on this as well. Uh, Jackie Smith uh, says that, Gabe, she uh, uh, really appreciates your book. Thanks for writing it. Um, and says, I always think about how we take our analysis and apply them to work for social change. Um, how can your analysis inform struggles for universal health care as a human right? Yeah, I mean, the truth is that I don't think that we're going to win universal health care as a human right until the level of struggle over the health care system at the grassroots is significantly higher. Than it is now. I mean, I would have loved if, you know, the presidential election had gone in a different, I mean, I'm happy November went the way it did, but if it had gone in a different way and, you know, uh, a candidate who supported universal health care as a human right had won and swept in a Congress, but it's just not, it's not how it works. I mean, you don't liquidate a, you know, multi-trillion dollar industry uh, just by squeaking through into the White House one day, right? You have to have a massive mobilization and struggle to do something like that. I mean, like that's what we're talking about when we talk about making healthcare a genuine human right, a real universal healthcare system. We're talking about liquidating an enormous and enormously powerful industry. And it's not just that they're rich and that they have lobbyists and that they, you know, essentially bribe politicians and all this kind of thing, although all that's true. But beyond that, people, regular people have all kinds of investments in the healthcare industry. Uh, I don't mean financial investments, although that too. Um, but rather, you know, people are nervous to lose what they have. And uh, I think the classic example of this that I like to give is, I don't know if you all remember, during the fight over Obamacare in 2009, 2010, uh, which is when the Tea Party started cropping up, and people started coming to uh, Tea Party demonstrations set carrying signs that said, keep your government hands off my Medicare. And, you know, we made fun of them because, you know, it's a public program. So it's a silly thing to say at a certain level. Uh, and it seems to indicate that the person carrying this sign is confused. They're not confused, right? What they're saying is this benefits me. Don't change it. I don't care if it doesn't benefit other people, right? That's what that means. And I think, you know, there's a million versions of that all hived throughout the healthcare system, right? People in various ways have carved out their pieces of it and gotten something from it. 
And, you know, we shouldn't blame them. I mean, it's a cruel system and people get what they can from it. Um, but it creates an organizing problem. And it's the reason that you can't just like elect a good candidate and do it like that. So I think that there has to be a very significant level of building of solidarity and struggle and organization at the level of, you know, uh, forming unions in, in workplaces and, you know, defending, defending points of access for underserved communities and all of these kinds of things. The everyday fights over how healthcare is provided and what it's like to work in the industry. It's only when that, that tide rises significantly higher that I think people are going to be able to transcend the little bits of the healthcare system that they want to hang on to for themselves. So I think in some way that's daunting, in some way it's less daunting because it means that I think it's productive to engage in these kinds of fights wherever you are, right? As opposed to just, you know, calling Bob Casey and saying, will you please co-sponsor Medicare for all? But right? there's actually something you can do, which is to fight against medical debt, to fight against understaffing, to fight for against tax exemption, to actually engage in all of these struggles. But I'm, I would love to hear what others think about this. Um, I'm not going to answer a question, but I do kind of want to ask one. I've also been reading the side questions, so maybe some of this is relevant. Um, there are many questions, which is really cool. Um, and I, so I just, one thing that I didn't mention and that hasn't come up yet, um, Gabe, is I think something that your book did that no, no, nothing else I've read has done on healthcare and healthcare workers and things like that is really intentionally tie these fights and sort of the growth of this sector to prisons, um, sort of both are described in the book at various points as like fixes to social problems that were created by the collapse of like the core of the industrial economy, right? Um, th this seems very obvious now, you know, when I think about it, having read the book, like if we talk about a community like Braddock or, you know, any community that has lost jobs has sort of seen rising rates of, say, substance abuse problems happening in a community. I mean, Western Pennsylvania, this is a lot of the towns around here are experiencing this. You know, you experience either a fix in the form of prisons or a fix in the form of, you know, fighting to save your hospital, right? And a hospital was sort of being propped up and given um, as a means to sort of resolve these social problems. So I'm just curious, you know, to ask, like, what were you trying to do with this? Because I think it was a really useful intervention on your part, but also to the questions that people have raised about, like, you know, racial divisions within struggles and within um, the healthcare worker community itself. Um, I don't know. These issues seem really live, obviously, in Pittsburgh, because Ed Ganey just won. Summer Lee is from Braddock, is a black elected, like left wing official um, who takes on some of these fights as well. And so I just for this particular audience, I feel like speaking to that and the potentials and those those often sort of separately placed fights um, might be illuminating. And certainly I want to hear the answer to it. Sure. Um, thanks for that question, Alex. Um, so this is something the book says. Uh, which I sometimes, I, you know, I, I want to be careful about how I say it because I think it can, it's easy to make this argument in a sloppy way. But uh, there are two parts. Uh, if you think of the government, if you think of the American state as having various capacities, right? It has its kind of war making capacity, right? It has its kind of infrastructure capacity. It has, there are different things that it does. Uh, and if you think of the social state, the part of the state that attends to social needs, um, in various ways, right? I mean, social security and unemployment and, you know, things that we think of as welfare. Uh, there are two parts of it that have grown over the last, oh yeah, I was born in 1986. So since a little bit before I was born, there are two parts of it that have grown while well, all the rest of the social state has shrunk. And those are the healthcare system and the prison system. Now you might say the prison system shouldn't be thought of as part of that. But uh, I think it's actually important to understand it in that light. The prison system has stepped in to, to soak up uh, people who, you know, employers can't make money by employing anymore. So they've been made surplus in the labor market. And the rest of the welfare state generally isn't there to support them anymore because it's been slashed back since the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, and so they get caught by the prison system and the prison system grew really rapidly in the exact period when steel mill jobs are going away and so on. Uh, and, you know, prisons, I mean, they do keep people alive. They also kill them in various ways, right? But they keep them, they feed them and they house them and they punish them and they make them miserable and sort of torture them at the same time. Um, so uh, I think it's important to see that dynamic, the growth of that system happening alongside the growth of the healthcare system as these two parts 
of the social state that because of various things about their politics and how they were set up, managed to expand uh, and to soak up the damage uh, and the displaced people who were pushed out by deindustrialization. Now, I don't think we should, I don't think those systems are the same as each other. One of them I don't think really should exist. And one, I think we should have a healthcare system. So they're very different. Um, but uh, I think if we think of them together in that light, then it lets us start to think about, okay, what is the right way of organizing politically? People who aren't that valuable as workers necessarily, right? Uh, a lot of our population has been, as manufacturing has moved overseas or been automated, um, as really profitable industries like finance and tech don't employ that many people. Uh, a, we, a lot of our population is not that valuable as workers, but rather are valuable as patients or prisoners for institutions that can capture them. Um, and I, it seems to me that there is a way, if you, if you think of it in those terms, you can begin to imagine how struggles around policing and Black Lives Matter might be connected to things like fighting for healthcare access, to fighting for humane conditions inside healthcare institutions, or fighting for good working conditions for healthcare workers, who very often, especially at the low end of the wage scale in the healthcare industry, come from economically marginalized communities. So it's very common to have, you know, a an African-American family, a brother and a sister, and he's likely to have gone through the, relatively likely to have gone through the prison system in some form, because that's who it's targets, is particularly African-American men. And she's likely to work in the healthcare system because that's who works in, in its bottom levels. Uh, so if you think of the population like that, you can begin to imagine, I'm not saying it tells you how, but you can begin to imagine the kinds of organization across lines of race and gender and different kinds of experiences of inequality that I think could uh, have some base, unifying basis. And I, that's what I hope to kind of get out of that comparison. I'd like to uh, focus on another question here. Uh, this one um, from Tess. And Tess asked, uh, do you have any comments on the interplay of the care industry with uh, the insurance and the pharmaceutical industries? And Tess yeah. likens it to the military industrial complex. So yeah, right. It is. It's a classic if, industrial complex. If it's, well, uh, any of you have uh, comments on that, please. Uh, well, I'll try to answer briefly and then I'll try to pass it off to others. Um, so, um, you know, the thing about healthcare that I've been describing is this kind of productivity problem that you can't really make healthcare provision that much more efficient. Uh, and if you do, you really screw it up. Um, this creates this strange dynamic in the healthcare industry where the product doesn't get cheaper every year, right? This is how we're used to most products working in capitalism. They get cheaper every year. And this is not, as we all know too well, how healthcare works. Um, and instead, you have a struggle, not just between workers and employers, not just between patients and providers, but among the different industries of the healthcare, within the healthcare industry, industry over the healthcare dollar. And in Pittsburgh, we know this all too well, right? From the high mark UPMC debacle. Um, the reason UPMC formed into the kind of monopoly that it formed was to try to capture enough market power to dictate rates to the insurer, the biggest insurer being high mark, which is the former Blue Cross Blue Shield and Blue Shield after they merged. Um, high mark saw UPMC trying to form this monopoly so that it could dictate rates to them and thought, you know, we better, uh, you know, go into the hospital business. They acquired, um, I mean, now they now own West Penn and they, they I believe they own AGH. Um, and, you know, UPMC then launches, launches its insurance company. So they're each trying to capture market power because they can't make more money by getting more efficient, right? <laughs> this is the key thing about this industry that they can't make more money by getting more efficient. They can make more money by gouging workers and by gouging patients. But if you want to gouge patients, they can't have anywhere else to go, uh, right? You can't have a competitor who can offer good services for a lower price. So there's this kind of competition between the insurer and the provider that has led to this monopolistic dynamic that has especially been painful in Pittsburgh. Um, in some ways, drug companies have stepped in to try to offer a solution to this, uh, particularly, you know, in, in areas like formerly very labor intensive areas like psychiatric care. Um, right, where now the model is to drug people rather than to pay attention to them. Um, and in general, uh, you know, the 
we could think of pharmaceuticals as kind of trying to offer labor-saving devices, right? That if you can put people on some kind of drug, you don't have to keep them under care for as long. Uh, but that's also a strategy for the farm, for big pharma to try to soak up that dollar um, and to try to displace some of its, you know, it's, it's also competing with hospitals and insurers, in other words. Um, I mean, the whole thing is just extremely irrational. And, uh, you know, if we, it's like, it's, it's not how you would design it if you were designing it from the perspective of having a, a system for the benefit of patients, much less workers. Um, I think that the health insurance system is ultimately the most politically vulnerable. Um, and that's the reason that we focus on calling for Medicare for all, as opposed to first calling for like socializing the hospitals the way they have again in Great Britain. Um, and so that has been, I think, rightly the focus of a lot of this struggle, but I think it has to involve challenges to these other elements too. And particularly, as I was saying, kind of demands from workers and patients and so on. I'm sure others have thoughts on, on the evils of these industries. Well, <clears throat> this has been um, a, an extraordinary discussion, I think, with um, uh, a, a number of ideas that will really bear fruit as, uh, as we practice them. Um, unfortunately, we, we uh, are coming to an end. I, um, I can't say to Gabe and Alex and Rosemary how much uh, and uh, we do appreciate your uh, efforts and um, uh, I know we're asking the right questions now. Uh, and um, more than that, I think we have the opportunity and the time uh, to, uh, to work on them and build the constituency because it's there. Um, so, uh, in, in also thanking all the participants, I know there's a million questions yet unanswered, but uh, we really do appreciate your uh, coming. Uh, let, me, let me just tell folks by way of a, of a wrap up that uh, w there's other ways to also talk about um, our times and uh, our history and how it informs what our strategies. Uh, we have another way coming up at our program next month when we um, examine development, specifically uh, the development in the uh, early 1940s, where um, the Homestead Mill essentially uh, took over uh, a, a 10 block area and essentially uh, obliterated a, a a thriving neighborhood, uh, this uh, award in, in Homestead in order to expand capacity for World War II. Um, and we're gonna look at that and we have a wonderful, wonderful uh, speaker and researcher that can tell us everything about it, uh, Tammy Hepps. Uh, and Tammy has not only uh, looked at, at it from the standpoint of, of of the various ethnic groups uh, involved, but also as a development question and, and what happened to the people that were displaced, which is another uh, issue that has cropped up in our, our recent election about uh, affordable housing for people. And uh, so I think you'll be interested in hearing Tammy, who's a dynamic um, presenter and uh, the respondents that we're going to have. And um, those respondents will be uh, the, the uh, president of the Borough Council of Homestead, a uh, uh, Battle of Homestead member, Lloyd Cunningham, and um, a, uh, uh, a young couple involved in uh, de uh, development at Braddock uh, through uh, utilization of the arts and, and other issues. So um, that's going to that's gonna look at the deindustrialization of our area from another standpoint, but a vitally important one, and that is um, uh, where can people live and how can they afford it? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, what, are the, what are the options for, uh, for development in, in uh, our, our Rust Belt areas? So I hope you'll be interested in it. Uh, it's, uh, it's called, um,
The Destruction of the Ward, 80 Years Later. And it's Thursday, June the 10th at 7.30. It'll be our special Zoom program. You can register uh, now uh, by uh, going to our website and uh, and registering or checking out our, our weekly uh, email uh, notices to you. We also have coming up in July, uh, a, a little lighter subject, but uh, but an important one to all of us. It's called Unions and Protest Songs, Their History and How to Use Them Today. And again, um, we have wonderful local resources to help us uh, uh, with that program. And this will be uh, Dr. Ted Everhart, Edwin Everhart, who uh, also runs our labor choir here in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, that will also be a Zoom meeting. And finally, uh, for tonight, the program coming up in August uh, will uh, be uh, in coordination with the, um, uh, our friends and, and, and compadres down in West Virginia working on the Mine Wars Museum at Matewan, but also their program uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Blair Mountain Battle, uh, the, one of the, the seminal uh, points in the uh, history of trying to organize the coal industry in West Virginia. And um, we, will have a, we will sort of have a preliminary program of, of folks that will be um, making presentations during the whole Labor Day weekend uh, down in West Virginia. But they'll be, they'll be speaking on our Zoom program in August uh, and they will be a panel of historians and activists giving new perspectives about what happened at the 1921 battle between West Virginia mining families and the corrupt coal companies. So that's it. That's our program for, for August. Uh, three programs I hope you all find fascinating and interesting and, and fill in uh, the bigger point of what it's like to look at our history and think about our future. Um, Having said that, um, I want to tell all the folks that made contributions tonight um, uh, in questions, but also in 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 uh, donations through uh, through the uh, the request that we had for the uh, donations as part of the registration tonight. I want to thank you very much for those of you that were moved tonight to make a contribution. Uh, it's still possible, and uh, you can follow in the chat the uh, the route that there would be for you to find the website to make an online donation if you like. We certainly appreciate it. Um, our our member support has been growing incredibly this year, and um, we take it as a as a uh, as an affirmation that um, the programs have provided. Uh, uh, sustenance and inspiration to all of us in this really difficult time. And we do appreciate very much any efforts you can make to help us uh, continue to advance uh, and, and be able to have the funds to do so. And, and, I, and again, once again, I want to especially uh, thank our, our presenters tonight. Uh, Gabe, it's really been a pleasure knowing you these years as, uh, as your doctoral uh, uh, a thesis has now become a book. Um, it was amazing to hear a dramatization of this book on um, uh, on the media, the uh, the program, and and um, waiting to hear part two and part three pretty soon. But for those of you that uh, listen to um, uh, American Public Radio on WISA, you listen to on the media on Sunday. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to hear. Gabe uh, uh, talking about this book in the form of a of a of almost a play. It's great. It's very interesting and it's very well done. So um, thank you very much, folks. Uh, it's it's been a really good night, and we really appreciate it and we look we look forward to meeting with you. If uh, you'd like to be a uh, uh, know about our events and you haven't been signed up for our website, uh, for our uh, newsletter, our annual newsletter, you can do that at 
battleofhomestead.org is our website. Uh, please do that. And if you like, we have Zoom breakfasts and we have Zoom desserts uh, every other Wednesday. Uh, our next Zoom breakfast is Wednesday, uh, May the 26th, coming up next week, 9.30. Uh, again, on the website, let us know if you'd like to come to our Zoom breakfast. And these are informal uh, sharing sessions where um, uh, Battle of Homestead members and invited guests uh, have an opportunity to share what's going on and, um, and, uh, and what they're interested in. So uh, that's our Zoom breakfast, May the 26th. And then we'll have a Zoom dessert in the evening, two weeks later on June the 9th at 7 p.m. And again, let us know if you're not on the regular list to be notified of those, and you're certainly welcome to come and participate. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to all of our guests, solidarity. Oh, and thanks to our technicians for uh, bringing us a wonderful Zoom experience. And solidarity and good night to everyone. See you again soon.